Hello everyone, welcome to the 7th student. Today we're doing D1.1, which is DNA replication in IB biology. Let's get started. So first, when we're looking at DNA replication, I want you to understand the why. Most of my students never really understand this. Why do we replicate DNA? Okay, so for three main things. Okay, so for reproduction, to make offspring, you need new copies of DNA but also for growth and tissue repair. So for example, when you're growing, when you're a kid and you become an adult, you have to create a lot of new cells and each of those cells needs its own set of DNA. And similarly with tissue repair, when you get a wound, right, you need to create new cells and then each cell also needs a full set of DNA. So how does DNA replication work? So the two strands of the double helix separate, as you can see here, and then each one is used as a template to guide the creation of a new strand. What does this mean, guide the creation of a new strand? Remember, we do complementary base pairing, meaning adenine binds to thymine and guanine binds to cytosine, right? So not every base can bind to every base, and that's how we make sure that the DNA message stays consistent across DNA replications. Um, when replication is complete, then we get two new DNA molecules. So in this case, we'll get this new one and then this new one. Importantly, okay, this is called a semi-conservative process. How come? Well, this is a really important thing to remember. It means that each newly synthesized DNA has a new strand and an old strand, right? You have one of the pink strands and one of the orange new strands. So that's why it's semi-conservative and not totally conservative. Great. So now let's look at how does this happen in detail? But before we do that, I want to briefly mention that all of these slides, including extensive notes for each slide, are available on my website. And if you're not convinced yet, that's totally fine. You can get a free sample to check it out. But moving on to DNA replication. So how does this work? Well, two key enzymes you need to remember in SL. First of all is helicase. So helicase is this ring that you see over here, and it's shaped like a ring and it basically separates the two strands of DNA, right? So what it does is it breaks the hydrogen bonds between bases, right? Um, remember, adenine and thymine bind through two hydrogen bonds, and cytosine and guanine bind through three hydrogen bonds. So helicase breaks that and opens the strands up. And then DNA polymerase is this thing you see in yellow. What does this do? So DNA polymerase is what actually carries out replication, right? It assembles the new strands of DNA. Uh, it uses the original ones as a template, and then it adds one nucleotide at a time. And then once the hydrogen bond forms between that nucleotide and the original one in the template strand, it links it to the previous nucleotide via a covalent bond. What does this mean? So if we add a new uh, nucleotide here, right, we then need to link that to the existing chain, right? That's a covalent bond, and DNA polymerase does that. So remember the functions of these two enzymes. Great. And now this is something else that a lot of students really mess out on and don't understand. So I'm going to guide you through it in a super simple way. PCR and gel electrophoresis. What the hell are these? So there are two methods of using DNA for different investigations. So first, PCR, okay, I want you to understand this very, very clearly, is replicating DNA artificially, nothing more. Now, a lot of you always wonder, uh, why do we want to replicate DNA artificially? Okay, imagine you're in a crime scene, and you only find one hair of the victim or the murderer. Well, there might not be enough DNA there to do proper analysis, right? And you can't go back and get more hairs, because there might not be any. So what you want to do is you want to amplify, you want to replicate the DNA so that you have tons of DNA to work with, right? Imagine in 30 years the case opens again and you need to do some more uh, forensic investigation. You need that DNA. So you basically want to make sure that you have enough. So how does it work? It's a cycle of steps, basically, right? That happens repeatedly. And every single time that it happens, the quantity of DNA doubles. So what's the first thing that happens? The first step is called denaturation. And it basically involves using heat to separate the two strands, okay? Normally we use helicase for this, but we can't use helicase here because we're using really high temperatures, so helicase would denature. So instead we heat up to over 90 degrees and that makes the two strands separate. How come? Because the hydrogen bonds between them are weaker than the covalent bonds within the actual nucleotides, right? So what happens is the two separate. Once that happens, we cool it down a little and then primers are going to bind. So primers are like small, small uh, sequences of bases, right, that attach to the DNA and allow replication to start. They also allow you to select which part you want to replicate, right? Depending on which primer you select, you can choose different parts of the DNA to replicate. And then what you do is you heat it up again 
And then the new strand is assembled from the primer, right? So from here, we're going to elongate here. And from here, we're going to elongate here. Uh, and how that happens is through a polymerase. But it is not human DNA polymerase. Super important to remember, okay? DNA polymerase, the human one, would denature at this temperature. Remember what denaturation is. You can always check that video out. But instead, we're using TAC DNA polymerase. TAC DNA polymerase comes from a bacteria which lives in hot springs, meaning it's adapted to really, really high temperatures. But it does the same thing. It adds nucleotides, right? So important to remember these three steps, right? We're mimicking replication, but artificially. And then afterwards, we can do gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis often follows from PCR. We do it afterwards. And what it does is it separates DNA molecules by length, right? So this it is kind of hard to visualize, okay? But it's just like a tank which, which has a gel in it. And there's electrodes on both ends. So there is a positive charge here and a negative charge here. And what you do is then you load your samples of DNA that you got from PCR and you apply the charge. Because DNA is negative, it's going to move towards the positive pole, so in this direction, right? Um, and then the important thing is that small molecules move faster than larger ones. So it separates them according to length, meaning this fragment over here, for example, is much smaller than this one because it's moved much, much faster. What can you use this for? Well, first, to test for coronavirus, for example. So you can take a swab uh, and then amplify specific sequences using PCR. And if you find enough DNA of that sequence, then you have COVID. And that only uses PCR. But then to use PCR and gel electrophoresis, for example, there's paternity testing. So you take DNA from the child, the mother, and the suspected father. You PCR it so you have enough. And then you do gel electrophoresis. And what you do is you basically use these things called short tandem repeats, which are sequences of bases that are repeated consecutively. Why? Because individuals vary in the number of repeats of these sequences. So I might have two repeats, but you watching might have seven, right? So this is going to result in different movements along the gel. So then what you can do is you can do it alongside for the three. And if the child matches the father's, then you know that it's the dad, right? Because these short tandem repeats are inherited. Remember, short tandem repeats, okay? Um, it's basically short sequences of bases that are repeated consecutively. So it could be A-T-A-A-T, -A -A -T, and that's repeated 10 times or five times, depending on the individual, okay? Great. So first of all, we need to look at directionality. So... In a DNA strand, as you hopefully know, all nucleotides have two covalent bonds. So basically between the phosphate and the next sugar up here and between the sugar and the next phosphate down here. So one terminus is called the three prime end, this one. Why? Because this is the first carbon. So then this is the second one and this is the third, fourth and then fifth, right? So that's why this is the five prime end. So this means that there is directionality, okay? It's not the same to attach a nucleotide to the 5' prime end than to the 3' prime end because they are different, okay? So DNA polymerase, which we just talked about, works in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So that means that the 5' prime phosphate of a free nucleotide is linked to the 3' prime end of the growing strand. So new ones are added here, basically, as I show with that um, pointer, right? So remember, the two strands um, formed when helicase separates the DNA are anti-parallel, right? Meaning replication moves in opposite directions. That's quite important, okay? So when one strand, it moves towards the replication fork, so the replication is continuous, okay? But on the other, it moves away from the replication fork, so it is not continuous. So here's where it's continuous, the leading strand. You can see DNA polymerase is just going to move in this direction. And thus, when helicase starts opening the strands, it's going to move with it, right? So it's fine. It's continuous. It's the leading strand. But then here, because it's still, it still needs to go five prime to three prime, right? It's going to go in the other direction, meaning at one point, it's just going to reach the end. And when it reaches the end, it has to go back and start again with the next um, sequence, right? And these uh, in the lagging strand, right, because it's done in a series of lengths, right, so it's done not continuously, these fragments are called Okasaki fragments. Important to remember, okay, Okasaki fragments are the fragments that are generated in the lagging strand. Great. So finally, you need to know these enzymes that also play a role in DNA replication. But importantly, okay, this uh, you only need to remember for the prokaryotic system. So this is in prokaryotes. Um, so DNA primase, first of all, okay, 
at a primer to guide the polymerase. This is what we were talking about with the PCR. So a primer is just a chain of around 10 nucleotides, right, which provides a site for the polymerase to bind, and it tells the polymerase where to start replication. Great. Then DNA polymerase 3 is the one that actually starts the complementary base pairing. It's what we just talked about, right? It adds the nucleotides, and it also does proofreading, meaning if there's a mismatch, right, because there's been a mistake in adding the nucleotide, it deletes it and puts another one back in. Then the DNA polymerase 1 takes the primers away, right, and replaces it with DNA nucleotides because the primers are RNA nucleotides. So what it's going to do is it's going to remove the primers specifically from the lagging strand. Why? Because the lagging strand has tons of primers. Every single time that you start again, because remember it's lagging, right, it's going to have to put a new primer. So the DNA polymerase 1 substitutes the primers, and then the DNA ligase, these work together, the DNA ligase then connects the gaps between Okasaki fragments to make one single continuous chain. Okay, that's it, okay? This is quite difficult, I know. So even though there's not a lot of content, there might be questions. So make sure to leave them in the comments and I'll respond to every single one. But now let's do some questions. So first, what is the role of DNA helicase in DNA replication? All right, pause now. And as always, I'll count down from three and you can think about it. So three, two, and one. Okay, remember, it breaks the hydrogen bonds between base pairs, right? The whole point of DNA helicase is to separate the strands, and that requires breaking the hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. So breaking hydrogen bonds. Next question. Which enzyme is responsible for joining Okasaki fragments during DNA replication? All right, again, three, two, and one. DNA ligase. Remember, DNA helicase separates the strands, polymerase 3 adds the nucleotides, and then the ligase is the one that actually joins the Okasaki fragments after polymerase 1, not primase, right? After polymerase 1 substitutes the primers. Great. And last question, which is one strand of DNA replicated discontinuously? 3, 2, and 1. Okay, so it's because a DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the 3 prime end. Remember, it works 5 prime to 3 prime, and because the two strands are anti-parallel, on one of them, it can't grow continuously, so it needs to do so in chunks. Helicase only in once in one direction, yes, but that's not the, the reason why, right? It's discontinuous. If um, DNA polymerase could go in both directions, then that would be fine, right? Then primase functions on one, only one strand that has nothing to do with it, and then Okasaki fragments require reverse transcription that has nothing to do with it either. Reverse transcription is making M, uh, DNA from mRNA, not the case in DNA replication. Great. I know this topic is complicated. Any questions, leave them in the comments. And until then, I'll see you next week. Good luck with the exams, everyone.